Hello, konnichiwa, ni hao and guten tag. Welcome to Burlington House here in London. And we're here with a special panel on progressive plastics to mark the end of three days of scientists from countries including Germany and China and Japan and the UK all being here together trying to share ideas, share their knowledge about the best way to tackle the problem of plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is something that uh, hasn't actually really been a phrase for very long. Um, for years, decades in fact, people lived quite happily with this versatile, useful, waterproof substance. But things have changed in the last few years. We've all become a lot more aware of the problems that plastic can cause when it gets out into the environment. No thanks to Sir David Attenborough, who's really drawn attention to the problem through his, pla through his show Blue Planet 2. The number of Google searches, for instance, for phrases like plastic pollution and beat plastic pollution weren't really used before, but now they're being described as breakout phrases. And actually, the increase in the number of times they're being used is too high to quantify. So we've seen the problems that plastic can cause, and more and more people therefore want solutions. Is chemistry going to provide us with the answers? Before I introduce you to the people on my right, I just want to say that if at any point you want to join in with this discussion, we'd love to hear what you think. Uh, Elizabeth Ratcliffe from the Royal Society of Chemistry is on my left and she'll be processing all your comments that you make in the live chat and on the Facebook page. Um, and also feel free to tweet us, Royal Society Chem, Roy, Roy Sock Chem, and the hashtags are Progressive Plastics and RSC Sustainability. So, in no particular order, we'll go from the far right. We're joined by Professor Xiang Hong Wang from Changchun Institute of Applied Chemistry. Then Professor Charlotte Williams from the University of Oxford. Professor Andreas Greiner from the University of Beirut. And Professor Toshiaki Yoshioka from Tohoku University. I hope I said all those right. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Can I just say it's really great news that after three days of being locked in a room trying to solve one of the biggest problems in the environment, you're all still smiling and chatting to one each other. That's really good to hear. First off, just a quick question is, how do we look at the impact that plastic has, both negative and positive? Shang Hong, can we start with you? What do we look at? Yeah, as a polymer scientist, I really believe uh, plastic should be uh, positive and it has positive impact uh, in human beings and in the world. Yeah. And how do you quantify the positive and how do you line it up with the negative that can come from them? Yeah, the so point is, is, you know, countries uh, in the world, we use almost uh, uh, 300 million tons of plastic. So it gives us a lot of convenience and uh, also we can find many, many applications uh, from plastic, so it should be positive. But uh, you know, sometimes we f really c uh, find some concern from uh, po plastic, so we should uh, face the concerns and uh, solve uh, based on our knowledge on chemistry. Yeah. And Charlotte, when you look at the impact of plastic, what sort of things are you looking at? Well, to start with, um, Following on from Professor Wang's statements, it's really important to consider that plastics are applied in a really broad range of our everyday lives. So of course we know the very visible plastic packaging, but polymers also perform key roles in sectors like construction, where they make sure that our homes are properly insulated and that we can use a range of materials. They're very important in electronics. They're essential to lightweighting transport. Nearly 50% of a car or an aeroplane would be polymeric components. And so they bring so many benefits in terms of sustainability to our lives that we must not forget this. But there are very real concerns with what happens once we've finished using them. And we need to improve upon this so that we overcome that negative impact that they can have. Andres, what, to what extent do you think it's chemistry's job to solve this problem rather than society's problem? I would like to extend this a little bit by saying uh, we have an impact of plastic and we have an impact of plastic handling. This we should keep apart. And chemistry can help here, of course, by making plastics which are uh, better suitable for um, 
the particular application they are meant for, they even enable certain applications only, this with a appropriate chemistry, but it already starts in its production, that it's more sustainable, uh, less CO2 footprint, and so on, what we all want to have, of course. We're going to unpick that a little bit more later right. on. But uh, Yoshioka, first I want to talk to you about degradability. Um, a lot of people, when they think, because plastic pollution is such a visceral thing, people can see the plastic, they see the problem. And, but there's still a lot of confusion about how plastic degrades. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and, uh, concerning the measurable terrorist and environmental impact of the plastics, uh, it's uh, the good, uh, not good. And however, uh, even now, the lifestyle is lost without plastics. There are so many plastics produced around us to help our uh, li uh, lives. And then the, if the uh, plastic is not degradable, uh, in that case, the, uh, the plastic have a lot of impact in the environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, uh, plastic have a good uh, advantage. Uh, for example, the, uh, if uh, you go shopping, uh, and uh, buy a uh, milk or juice uh, with glass bottles or plastic bottles. And uh, ob obviously, the plastic bottles can carry more drinks in one shopping. We use less energy. Uh, and uh, plastic uh, degradable is important, but uh, plastic not degradable is very important for our life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Andreas, can I ask you a little bit about, is there a way that we can break down plastic and polymers without hurting the environment? What all we do, human beings, as we are, if we act something, we somehow, of course, have an influence on the environment. There will be never no influence. And uh, with the degradation of polymers, of course, uh, we also have an impact on the environment. Just to give you an example, if we degrade uh, one of the standard degradable polymers, uh, which are meant for degradation, we change, for example, the pH. The question is how, is, how much is this? So there will be some dosage for the nearer environment, but maybe not for the wider environment. What is most important is that during the degradation process, no toxic components are developed. Very often, of course, there is the development of, for example, carbon dioxide in the degradation of nowadays degradable polymers. So one has to make then a trade-off. Is it worthwhile to do that or not? Yes. Oh, I actually had a question through earlier from Wei, who says, um, when you are sort of changing the degradability, are you making a compromise on all those uh, attributes of plastic that makes it so useful? Shang Hong, what do you say to that? Yeah, actually, we need uh, a uh, trade-off between uh, degradability and uh, performance. But anyway, currently based on our chemistry and also our physics, uh, we call polymer blending, something like that. Then we can make such a balance for degradability and uh, uh, performance. I just want to pick up on what you said, that there is a compromise on the performance. What sort of things will be less efficient with plastic if we make it more biodegradable? Yeah, actually, the first thing we should uh, uh, satisfies the function for a certain application, then uh, we may uh, find a way to adjust uh, the degradability and uh, we can control uh, the, the length or the time, how long it will degrade. Yeah. And Andreas, are these methods there yet? Can chemists do this at the moment? I think we basically have the tools, uh, but we have to put the tool together to do that better. And I would like to emphasize this is trade-off situation. I'll give you an example. If we have to increase the crop production, which we have to do, we have only a limited amount of square meters on this planet Earth, we have to increase the crop productivity in the future. We might have to use the degradable plastic in order to increase this. Then we have a CO2 maybe development during this degradation, but we maybe also increase the crop production, which is of utmost importance for the future of our children and grandchildren. And this you also mean by the trade-off. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, some people might say that if you make plastic more degradable, um, it's not really going to teach the world about being sustainable. They'll be like, well, if I chuck this away, it will disappear, no harm done. 
To what extent is that possibly going to happen? We've discussed this at length over the last three days at our meeting and we are um, very clear that although we can propose technical solutions that allow plastics to be broken more easily back to their small molecules, we are not proposing the indiscriminate disposal of plastics in the environment. This is not our solution to the problem. We need to use technical innovation to redesign these high performance products and I'm very confident that our field can do this but the behaviour of people, we need also to tackle that as a society. We are not advocating a throwaway culture and the waste of this precious material, however it is made and whatever it may degrade to. Even if those degradation products are non-toxic, we still say this is precious material. We need to recycle it and reuse it and not have it out there in the environment. I'm glad you mentioned recycling because that's another aspect that you've all been looking at over the last few days. Yoshoka, um, what problems are there with recycling plastic and polymers at the moment? Yeah, and uh, that reason is uh, both technical issues and uh, uh, economic issues. Mm -hmm. And there are two issues is a big problem for the plastic issues. Yeah. So what do you, so it's, it's to do with how much it costs, but also presumably the way it's done. What problems can be caused a lot of people, Leone has actually messaged to say that um, uh, can recycling plastic be done without using a lot of energy? Yeah, uh, for example, then, uh, if the consumer uh, collaborate with, uh, when through uh, through way of the plastics mm -hmm. and the energy used for uh, recycling can be reduced. Mm -hmm. And then the, if various industrial technology can be uh, used well, uh, it's possible to cover the energy consumption uh, for recycling with energy of the uh, manufacturing processes. And what changes can be made to plastics to make them more recyclable, would you say? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, and uh, almost yes. Almost yes, it's possible to do the changing. Mm -hmm. how, how would that change? What does that change look like? Yeah. Uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, is that question the meaning of uh, plastics? Yeah, what, changing? Well, how can you change a plastic? Yeah, uh, uh, considering in our life, and uh, maybe the, it's difficult, <coughs> difficult. But uh, we have to uh, tackle uh, plastics uh, at good, uh, good solutions. Uh, and uh, some plastics can uh, change other materials, uh, but uh, uh, almost plastics is uh, difficult to change other materials. For example, uh, considering the uh, electric appliances and the automobiles, uh, they have a lot of the plastics to reduce of the uh, energy consumption. If the uh, 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 automobiles uh, uh, changing to the old metals, in that case, the uh, carbon dioxide emission is a more lot. Uh, uh, for example, packaging plastics uh, is a, uh, maybe the uh, I hope to the little bit changing with the other plastics mm -hmm. for the uh, environmental friendly materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, you want to say something? We, we discussed in some detail um, some of the challenges with recycling. And in future, um, it's clear that we need to have efficient separations um, of plastics. Technically, it's really important to realise that polymer can be recycled within a reasonable temperature range. And I say this because many times you see that people wish to replace plastics with materials that might be even more energy if it uh, cost to recycle, like metals or glass. So to recycle those materials requires a very significantly greater energy input than it does for polymers. And some of the challenges for recycling of polymers involve that they are not a single thing. They are a mixture of different chemistries. 
And so if we can improve that separation of those chemistries, we can then develop the technology to allow for this recycling. Zhang Hong, you're nodding along to everything Charlotte said there. <laughs> yeah. As you know, uh, uh, there are two ways to reduce the plastic impact on the environment. One is recycle the plastic, the other one is degradation. So uh, in some way, in some way, recycle cannot be done very well. I mean, energy and cost issue. So uh, like in China, as you know, we have huge land for motion film, for agriculture motion film. So it's nearly impossible to recycle more than 60% or 7%. So we need uh, biodegradation. So this means a change of plastic uh, from traditional non-degradable plastic to biodegradable. Or in this morning, we discuss for environmental de degradable plastic. Yeah. So it's not a case of either or, it's yeah. both together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But so how much is it of one improving degradability versus improving recycling? Andreas, what do you think? It depends on the application very clearly. Uh, like in, in agricultural fields, you want to have, of course, uh, degradation more. It's next to impossible if you have a huge field in China <laughs> to recollect that everything is simply not efficient to do that. Uh, but if you have a material, for example, like a coffee beaker we get here in a coffee shop in London, this could be nicely recycled and it's either trash can there. And here I would like to make a point. In uh, some countries we have already good recycling systems, they can be always improved, but I also see other countries where not any even garbage management systems are there, not talking about recycling. And here clearly uh, maybe also sometimes the education is missing to have the awareness to do that. Everybody can do his own chemistry or her own chemistry by simply collecting the plastic instead of throwing that in the environment. And I think all these things have to come together. Education, garbage management system, uh, polymers, which are, by the way, not simple materials. They are complex materials. They are like a Lego system, which have to be put together either to be clearly uh, degradable, to be clearly recyclable, that you can, that they survive long, that they can be reused again. Many plastics could also uh, get kind of degraded through the recycling process, and then they are maybe even useless after recycling, then only burning remains, and this can be not a solution. Yes, tell us a little bit more about burning. That's an interesting issue, because a plastic is although a container for energy, and we always have to make a trade of is the burning of a plastic a better solution, or it's recycling, because recycling also takes energy, and it's usually uh, connected to a loss in quality, for example, if I want to use that now for a windshield for a high-speed train, maybe I would not want to use recycled plastic. Maybe the transparency is missing because of the recycling process. Mm -hmm. Then I have to think whether this would be better to burn, at least get the energy back. This needs a so-called difficult world now, life cycle assessment. This has to be done professionally and should, is done in industry. Academics, you should do that less, like chemists like me, need colleagues helping here. But this has to be done more if it comes in a real application field. A lot of people, when they hear about burning plastic, will suddenly become a bit panicked about the emissions that could come from that um, and the emissions that come from recycling plastic. Um, what plans could there be in order to mitigate the effect on climate change as you try and tackle plastic pollution as mm -hmm. a problem? Charlotte? Or, and, sorry, Andreas. Okay. <laughs> Um, that is an important question. We all want to and have to reduce the CO2 footprint. There's no doubt about that. We know all why that is the case. And uh, recycling is not recycling. Recycling can be really either break it down to the starting materials and reuse it again. This is a very efficient process, but also a demanding process, which has maybe a CO2 footprint. One, but we can also re-engineer it and make out of a beaker maybe a table for example, or a cloth, then it will have a different CO2 footprint. But whatever we do, we will need some energy. Again, the trade-off is a, is a solution. We have to see 
Is it easier to make a new polymer and burn the rest, get the CO2, or just to recycle it? This has to be carefully calculated and cannot be ended. Plastic is a white field. There is not a single plastic. We have a huge variety of plastics because in our everyday life, it's like oxygen. We all have to breathe here. And out in the world, we have to breathe. We don't notice the oxygen, but it's not there. We notice it. Same with the plastic. Yashoka, have you got anything you'd like to say more about yeah, recycling? Now, now they're focusing on the carbon dioxide, but <laughs> uh, uh, considering the plastic recycling and the plastic treatment, and uh, we have to, to consider the other uh, chemical substances. For example, the plastic container and a lot of the additives. And uh, sometimes they added, uh, uh, added to the environment, but uh, now that they are prohibited from using them. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, the process of the covering plastic of chemical raw materials uh, can be recycled as resources, as a raw materials without generating harmful substances. And of course, the carbon dioxide is one of the harmful substances. Uh, 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 harmful substances. Uh, and uh, how to treat of the uh, plastic materials, and uh, we have to consider and uh, every kind of the chemical substances. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to do all, make all these changes? Yeah, and uh, uh, we have uh, many type of the plastic recycling method, and. Uh, physical recycling processing and uh, chemical recycling process and the uh, burning and uh, I don't like the burning naming. <laughs> I want uh, uh, it better to the energy recovery system. Energy and, recovery. Uh, energy recovery. Okay. And the three a type of the uh, recycling is a method uh, we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we uh, uh, have to the select which uh, recycling system is better mm -hmm. of the, uh, each plastic materials. Uh, depend on uh, which is uh, depend on the uh, dirty one and the impurity ones and the how to the history of the how to use that one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we have to select it to the which recycling method is better okay. um something that's been mentioned a bit over the last few days is new plastics um charlotte what do we mean by new plastics exactly well um we've alluded to the fact that plastics catches a lot of different um, materials, chemistries, additives, and forms of material, not just the uh, plastic packaging. And so when we talk about new uh, plastics and polymers, we've got an opportunity here as a field and as an industry to think really carefully about the way that we design at a molecular level and at the article level the objects that we use. And so this might mean careful redesign of existing materials to make sure that they really uh, fulfill these sustainability criteria. What is your criteria when you come to, we want to make something more sustainable, what is the criteria that it's, you mark it against? Exactly as um, Andrea said, it's a complete um, examination of what happens from the very beginning of making the polymer, the raw material you use, through its use and what happens at the end. Now, the difficulty in doing that type of assessment is how do you relatively offset different impacts? And I think we've already alluded to this. But that's what we are using already as a field and will continue to use in proposing new types of plastics. One of the really inspiring things that we've heard here at CS3 is the potential to use unconventional starting materials to make some of these plastics. Like what? Well, for example, we might be in future using um, wastes from agriculture or from other industries. We might be more efficiently using some of the plastics that are out there and reforming them into new types of chemistry and product. We might even be using CO2, that most troublesome of gases, as a raw material to make polymers from. So one of the great excitements for me here is hearing that in future we use these range of natural chemistries to improve the ability to break at the end of the life that polymer into uh, things that can be recycled or where the application demands it, biodegraded. It sounds like new plastics have the potential to solve a lot of problems at the same time. But Andres, how expensive is this, though? That's what a lot of people wonder. 
Are you looking at me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not going to pay for it all? <laughs> um, uh, the, of course, the development of a new plastic is always expensive. It starts with the research, with the fundamental research which has to be done, and numbers of uh, uh, students and professors have to work on that. Then this has to be transferred to industry. They have to do the build up the production, the quality management. It's a long process. And then finally, the marketing people have to bring it in the market, has to survive the regulation and everything. But it pays off. There's no way around. For, I want to give you an example. Oh, we you. all need better batteries, urgently, to reduce our CO2 footprint, to collect the sunlight, save it in, in the battery that we can heat our houses overnight and run the fridges also overnight. Mm -hmm. For this, we urgently need better membranes in the batteries, and these membranes are usually plastics. But the existing plastics are not good enough yet to really have the super batteries. So we are on, on a good way here, but there's a lot of room. It's just a single example for what we need or a better a packaging material for food packaging that our food is longer preserved. And here is, I'm not talking about communication, transport, for example, lightweight materials, which are important for the electric cars that they can run through London with less uh, 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 electricity consumption and to other places as well. And here is the room for the new plastics. And industry, I think, is aware of that, that they need new plastics. They could be more aware, of course, uh, but uh, there's no way around that. Are you seeing a lot of funding coming from industry into this kind of research? That's a good question. Question yeah. for all of you there. <laughs> <laughs> If I may, I think that industry are uh, really well engaged with this problem and uh, their, their customers and the general public are, are demanding this. So um, I, I, don't, I think it would be simplistic to imply that only academics would be involved in solving the problem. It absolutely wouldn't be so. Um, but w what's really important is that um, we accelerate through the process of improving these materials. And so close working with a range of industries is going to be really important because Andreas has given us a hint of how technologically complex, you know, there's a really piece of uh, customised design, even in a simple piece of, relatively apparently simple piece of plastic packaging. And so working together to make sure we get that right is really, really important, and we need to do it quickly. Mm. What other industries need to get on board then? Other industries than the chemical industry? Yeah. yeah. For example, in China, we have a, a, such kind of new plastic, like uh, biodegradable, biodegradable yeah. plastics, mm. and uh, actually started from uh, USA uh, and also German. And, uh, Currently in China, we have more than 1,000 factories, uh, companies uh, doing uh, biodegradable plastic. So they support a lot for academic uh, research. Yeah. Yeah. Scientists who work a lot with uh, com uh, chemical companies, with yeah. uh, car companies, textile companies, non-woven industries makes the filtration, agricultural companies, you name it. It's a standard for a polymer scientist to work with all these different industry is important and there's a constant communication and you're absolutely right uh, of course in industry uh, it's done a lot of research but I also think there has to be nowadays room for disruptive development mm. that we do not just improve the existing materials that we also think new avenues uh, for example for this battery problem to really get a kind of disruptive development. We need not only a constant development, we have to be faster. So we need some kind of new ideas, maybe for young people which are out there and they I have a brilliant idea and I come in there and they should have the room to do that. And how much research is being dedicated to examining the potential impacts of these new plastics on the environment? Or does that go hand in hand with developing them from the beginning? I think the awareness is now very high. Uh, in the past, we had a discussion about the danger and less the potential of nanotechnology. And in that time, the awareness in new technology is much more. And in fact, I'm very thankful that now people talk now about plastics. Because plastics somehow were given as given. It's there. It's very taken for granted. Now we talk about it. And it's so important to explain the layman out in the world what is the plastic? What do you have in your hand? You lay in the bed and you lay on plastic, maybe. Okay. You should know what you I, I became chemist because I want to know what is around me. That was the reason. And 
everybody has a right to know that. And so I think we have the duty to explain it in simple words, as simple as possible. Yes, I think I can speak for the whole world when they say that they want answers and they aren't often want simple ones. But, but if they can't get simple, quick answers, then at least you have it clearly explained to them that it's a bit more complicated. Um, we've talked about all these potential um, uh, developments that are being made in this field. What sort of time frames are we talking about when we're talking about making plastic more degradable, when we're talking about improving recycling? Is it going to happen in the next 10 years? Is it, to what extent is it already happening? They're the geographical aspect. There. <laughs> I geographical. think in China they are much faster. Yeah. Than yeah. 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 Well, let's it's go around the really world happens. with the answer. It really happens. Mm. Uh, and uh, as you know, currently, uh, but, uh, new plastic like uh, biodegradable plastic is still in the baby uh, stage. Mm. So we need uh, more chemistry and physics and uh, interdisciplinary cooperation to push such new plastic uh, for real or real application. Yeah. So, for example, like in China, our, our government encourages postage bag and uh, garbage bag and also in uh, agriculture mulching fuel. So they encourage whether we can find a way uh, to make such new plastics This has less environmental impact and also uh, less public concern on the final after, after use, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, I would say, how aware do you think the general public are that these changes are already being made and they're seeing them on their high streets or where they live? Yeah. You went over a number of years? <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to place a bet right now. In former times, the development of a new, a new plastic took about 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's of course no more there. We have now more, much better infrastructure to do the development. It takes some time. If you take a pill against headache, it also takes some time until the headache goes. Yes. But it is not like that. Of course, here I think uh, a, con a realistic aspect could be with the nowadays ways of communication and what all we know already 10 years. I just now say uh, uh, you can oppose that, but I think 10 years from scratch to that we see it on the shelf. Okay. Ten years. Brilliant. We'll all meet. Don't take me on that. Yes. Uh, in the case of Japan, yes. and, uh, the Japan, Japanese government make a, a plastic strategy until the 2030. Uh, that the main target is the uh, recycle ratio will be doubled mm -hmm. until now. And then the uh, biodegradable and bioplastics, uh, the market is more expanded mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, totally the uh, Two million ton production uh, in Japan, yeah. um, but uh, I think that that amount is uh, too low. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's uh, very very too high. Low. <laughs> you need a bit yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Japanese uh, make uh, that strategy, uh, and then the, uh, because the, uh, uh, if we use the new plastics, uh, including the bioplastics. In that case, the uh, uh, two right, uh, two uh, lowering the, the cost, and uh, in that case, the, we need to do the more expand the market, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, uh, that strategy is, uh, is the uh, recycling is double and the new uh, plastics making until the two, uh, uh, tw uh, 20, uh, 20, 30. 2030. 2030. Okay, I'm just going to take a. A step away now because we're getting a lot of questions coming in from people around the world. Uh, Elizabeth, what, what questions are coming in? So we've got people tuning in from all around the world from India to Bulgaria. Oh, so one yeah. question we've had from um, Teresa Mnoguera is are there any studies to create plastics from agricultural waste and if so can you give any examples? Yeah. From agricultural, agricultural waste? Yeah. So, so, will you be the best speaker that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a very uh, important uh, question, you know. Uh, currently, in China, uh, we, have, we used uh, nearly 2 million tons mm -hmm. of polyethylene mm -hmm. uh, for mulching film. So, uh, they cause a lot of uh, agricultural waste and uh, also may be harmful for soil, uh, soil safety. Mm. So, uh, in that case, we, at first we encourage recycle of such plastics, but uh, 
still we find that in huge land we cannot recycle so easily. Mm. So we, we may need biodegradable plastics uh, to push in to reduce the agricultural waste. Yeah. Okay, so. Maybe I can extend the a few a little bit on this interesting question yeah. because um, uh, Charlotte and myself and the many other colleagues work now on using the orange shells con yeah. ingredients yeah. Yeah. which are you we get a lot of orange juice and we get orange shells and uh, how to use the orange shell which is also uh, agricultural waste yeah. mm -hmm. and there's a compound in which we all know when you look on the back of your shampoo bottle you might read limonene mm -hmm. this comes out of the orange shells but uh, uh, our groups do, for example, with CO2 out of this, a very nice polymer. So one can use such ingredients of real agricultural waste from a plant to make uh, plastics. I think it's very nice to do that. It's not yet in application, as far as I know, but uh, many companies are interested in that. Hmm. Because also available in large amounts, not a small compound, uh, which we can get out. And what else to do with the orange shell? Some countries use the orange shells, like... Uh, in Brazil, they use it a lot nowadays for making uh, food for cows and so on. But in other countries, like in China, orange shells, as far as I know, yeah, are not used much. Yeah. Yeah. They're huge yeah. amounts, but not used for that. Yeah, there is a large potential. Uh, but in, Chi in China's case, and uh, China uh, uh, tried to make a lot of the biodegradable uh, plastics in the agriculture. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. But uh, in that case, it's ugly. Uh, but uh, uh, there are many kind of the uh, agriculture plastics, yeah. such as uh, 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 house. The cup, uh, house at the yeah, cupboard. Yeah, in that case, it's difficult to do the biodegradable yeah. plastic. In that case, the, we need to the recycle and the yeah. correct it. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, we have to the consider to the how to the degradable, how to the correct of the waste plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, and the two type of the uh, treatment is, uh, is necessary for the uh, sustainable plastic use. Yeah. Uh. Charlotte, do you want to add anything yes. to that point? So um, there are a number of plastics that are currently sourced from plants um, but at the moment the majority of those materials are still quite small scale the largest scale example would be polylactic acid and that comes from lactic acid that was originally sourced from glucose and at the moment that glucose source comes from crops that you might eat but actually in the future there's very uh, intense research and real possibility to substitute that with either non-edible crops or co-products of agriculture. I guess we have to always be a little bit careful with the term waste because um, uh, you know, um, what might be assumed to be a waste from one industry can find uh, over many years of human evolution other uses, right? But mm. I would say co-products, going along with other industries and finding uses for things that are currently not so valuable to them, that's, a, that's an interesting idea for making plastics and one um, that certainly the community is really engaged in researching. Yeah, it sounds very promising results thus far and there's yeah, a lot more room absolutely, to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, another question. So Sam Hill on YouTube wants to know, is there still a risk that biodegradable polymers will still break down into microplastics that could cause further environmental problems? I think it's a very good question and um, one in which uh, the uh, kind of environmental and toxicological community are very actively engaged. And um, at this point, I think it would be premature for anybody to say no in answer to that. But I think that the early signs in testing of those materials is that the design is appropriate. Um, there may be things to improve about the relative amount of time that it takes for things to biodegrade. We need to be very careful because the environment is a complicated place. <laughs> But um, we, uh, we are engaged in um, the scientific discussions and uh, we've seen that in a very inspiring way at this meeting. We've seen you know, um, both uh, very compelling evidence of the problem of pervasive microplastics that were made in, in the old fashioned ways and um, the research that's going to make sure that we avoid these unintended consequences in future. Yeah. Zhang Hong, do you see a world where we won't be talking about microplastics so much in the way that we currently do? Yeah, yeah during the past two years, we heard a lot of microplastics. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, for such kind of microplastics, uh, we can find it in the sea or also in, in the land. So, uh, 
it's true, but uh, uh, we can find a new way. If we can use new plastics, or if we can uh, use uh, like uh, biodegradable plastics, it can be degraded into not a microplastic, two molecules, mm -hmm. yeah, and like CO two and uh, water, something like that. So it should be uh, we we need the concern about uh, microplastics for such kind of new plastics. Yeah. It's all about breaking things down into nicer yeah. uh, things rather than microplastics. Andres? We have initiated a large research program on microplastic involving more than 30 research groups in Bayreuth and uh, surrounding universities because we don't know anything about the effect of microplastic. We know it there, more mm. or less. We know anything, what does it do to any organisms and to ourselves also? We don't know how it is transported through the different environments, water, air, and, and soil. It, it is happening, but we don't know how. And we don't know how it's being formed, because microplastic is not microplastic. It can consist out of many polymers, uh, uh, many ingredients which are in there. And uh, what is really a danger, if there is any danger? We don't know it yet, and we have to find it out. And there are worldwide ex uh, very intensive research efforts now to find out what is a microplastic do to us, and then only we can find solution to do something against it. And I would like to emphasize it's not a way to fish it out of the water in the ocean. You destroy so much organisms doing that, that uh, many of us strongly oppose that. Better is to avoid it at all, this is a better solution, or find other solutions. But for this, we need to know these mechanisms. And scientists and industry as well is now active in battling this problem. Would you agree that progression with things like degradability and recyclability can't really happen unless we know more about microplastics? No, I, I would not agree on that because these are two different issues. Um, for example, uh, the microplastic is the majority is being formed by polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, uh, just to name some of them, which are so-called commodity plastics, which are used in large amounts. In contrast, the degradable polymers, which are now in the market, are used in by far lower values. You might find them nowadays on a compost plant because they don't degrade in the time as they should degrade as the compost is bringing out of the fields. But this is really a relatively small amount in comparison to the so-called big plastics. I think it's really important to um, talk about the timescales for technological deployment in this field. So there's an immediate term crisis and we need immediate term research to understand what's happening in our environment. But we also need to kickstart research rapidly so that we can solve some of those problems. And we simply cannot afford to wait until we have all the answers about polythene before we begin bringing through the research, through that pipeline that takes time so that we have materials that, that don't give rise to these problems. So we, we have to talk to one another, we have to keep the two communities really um, in active discussion, but we can't do this in a linear way where we wait for the answer there before we make change. It's got to be everything Absolutely. happening at the same time. Absolutely. Elizabeth, I think we've got time for one more question before right. we have to write up. Georgina Gregory on YouTube wants to know, what do we do about the plastic already in the ocean? Andres, you touched question. on this just now, didn't you? What do you do about the plastic already in the ocean? You're not a fan of removing it with a net. <laughs> if I would know the end, uh, I would be maybe not sitting here. <laughs> um, I, I, as I said already, I think the fishing out of that is uh, not a solution. Like having big nets which go around and fishing out the plastic will may cause more harm than let it be there. What is the solution then? Uh, in fact, I have no proper answer for that to do with the plastic which is right now in the ocean. The question should Does be anyone have just how one? much we have already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure if we all knew the concrete yeah, answer, it would be happening yeah. already. And the finally, yeah. that I want to say, it, mm. and, uh, everyone should be uh, aware that not just a bad aspect of the plastics, but uh, uh, also they play important rules such as uh, improver. Uh, quality of life, uh, such as uh, reducing energy consumptions. And uh, I believe that and the current plastics issue, current plastics problem, such as a microplastic also, uh, is one of the uh, challenges that struck our lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, this issue is uh, not uh, focusing the plastic. And uh, uh, that is issues uh, to uh, uh, send to the uh, how to the lifestyle changes. That's an interesting yeah, yeah. point, Yoshioka, because a lot of people want to know, well, what if I take one thing away from this, what, what should I be doing so I can help with this plastic pollution everybody problem should, from your points of view? Everybody should stop immediately dumping garbage into the ocean, which is still happening. And if we would stop that immediately, this would help a lot. If everybody in the UN or wherever would commit themselves, we don't dump from boats and I don't know what, any garbage in the ocean anymore, this would help a lot. Xiao mm -hmm. you're nodding along. Yes. Uh, currently, uh, it's so difficult to deal with the uh, pollution, plastic pollution in the ocean. It's uh, very difficult. Also, maybe we can collect, uh, but it takes uh, uh, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, energy and the cost, yeah? it's cost issue. So I agree with uh, Glenn. You know, so currently, we just uh, uh, need more education and uh, so to stop pouring uh, plastic uh, to the, into rivers and the ocean. Yeah. And Charlotte, have you, mm -hmm. would you like to say anything? So I, I do think that it's a very um, interesting question that we're asked. Mm -hmm. And um, we heard at the conference of the importance of, um, of models and uh, understanding of what happens to that plastic that's in the ocean. And I think that that's essential that we build um, a almost world scale model of what's going on and I, by we, we I mean the community of scientists engaged in this activity so that we understand if there are easier opportunities to remove some of it so unlike Andreas I think if we can take some of that plastic out we should explore every possibility to do so until we are sure that there's not a negative impact because at the moment it is not clear what the impact of those materials in the sea is. And some of the interesting research here that we heard about was how often small particles get beached and washed away from beaches and so on. So uh, that was certainly very eye-opening for me. Um, and of course, uh, you know, a natural consequence of tides, one might say, but are there opportunities through really understanding that um, to, uh, gr to grab <laughs> some of that plastic out um, and, and you know, at least try and limit some of this effects. Of course, the comments that my colleagues make about immediately turning off the tap in terms of appropriate waste management is highly important. Thank you all so much for sparing the time. I know it's been a long three days and I'm really glad that you can share with everyone what you've been talking about and the full results uh, will be come out next year sometime, I believe. Um, but until then, thank you for giving us this insight into your world. Uh, it sounds very, very optimistic, but the, all the role that chemistry can play. But you're not alone in fighting this problem. It, it seems like in, a lot more work is needed across, well, around the world and across the board in order to tackle this plastic pollution problem. Um, I think that's all we've got time for, I'm hearing in my ear. Um, so thank you very much for uh, joining us today. The discussion here, the broadcast may be over, but the argument and the discussion will continue online. So please keep leaving your comments. Those hashtags again are progressive plastics and RSC, sustain RSC sustainability. Um, uh, we will be milling about and we will be answering some of your questions online after the session. Um, until then, thank you very much for tuning in.